Hi everybody, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Ashok Hariharan. I'm a, you know, I basically work in the legal tech space. Uh, but today I'm here to talk about something completely different, you know, something that is uh, pertinent to all of us. And I have a very special guest here that uh, I'm going to be having a conversation with. And uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Sean McDonald. Uh, he's the CEO of uh, Frontline SMS, uh, which is uh, one of the oldest uh, and still being used uh, monitoring systems in the humanitarian space, which is based on text messaging. It's been around for over 15 years. Uh, he's also a lawyer in the international law and alternate uh, dispute resolution space. And he's also a visiting fellow and advisor in various institutions. I mean, it's a very long list. So just to keep it short, I'll say uh, Stanford Law's Digital Civil Society Lab. Uh, he's also on IEEE's Ethics and AI Committee. And he's been published in various outlets like uh, Foreign Policy, Stanford Social Innovation Review, and uh, even the Cornell Legal Information uh, Institute's Journal. So the reason I'm talking to Sean today is about something that concerns all of us, uh, not just in India, but everywhere, you know, uh, we are here to talk about COVID-19, uh, specifically about how technical solutions have been rolled out left, right and center, apparently in a bit to save all of us. Uh, these choices have very deep implications beyond the immediacy of the pandemic. And what we will try and understand today is how will the widespread use of tech uh, in response to the pandemic impact society and you individually as a person. So I think that that aspect has been kind of missed out, how it affects you as a person. So I'd like to bring that out today. Uh, Sean can be considered as an expert in this area since uh, He's been working in the space. He's also written extensively about it. He wrote a very detailed study of the use of call data records, uh, which was an early kind of contact tracing uh, during the Ebola, you know, during the Ebola epidemic of 2014 in West Africa and also kind of spread to other parts of the world. Uh, the link to that paper is in the show notes. Plus, he's also written an article about the digital response to COVID-19. Uh, I urge you all to read both those papers when you have the time. Uh, so anyway, let's uh, roll ahead. I'll let Sean talk. So Sean, my first question to you, you know, just to, just to get the proceeding going is, uh, how is the tech solutions context different between the Ebola epidemic, which uh, was six years ago, you know, which is like a, a completely different era in terms of technology and during compared to now uh, in the age of COVID-19. Uh, what do you see as the common denominator? And uh, how has this, uh, how has the scale and the scope changed since then? And uh, what do you see as the lessons that were not learned since then? Yeah. Um Ashok, thank you for that extraordinarily generous introduction. I'm really excited to have this conversation. Also want to thank Karana for, for convening it. It's really great to be uh, uh, speaking with people who are considering and, and engaging critically with so many of the sort of technologies and issues that are happening kind of everywhere around the world. So it's been really, really exciting to, to, get, to, to get to engage. Uh, in terms of what's different, you touched on it for sure. Scale is a major difference here. Um, I think that one of the things that we really saw with the Ebola epidemic, and I think that we see a lot in terms of public policy focusing on technology in response to something like a public health crisis, is that it's, it becomes a challenge of leadership. And I think that what we're seeing in, in the COVID response, and certainly in the ways that different responses are, different countries are engaging, you have a really clear view that, that high quality leadership makes a difference here. And, and so much more so in many instances than the specifics of a technology. And so in Ebola, the idea was called was call detail records or, or mobile phone kind of backend databases as the way that we, the, the technology that we might use to help track people. Uh, and what we're seeing with COVID is obviously much more app-based, much more sort of Bluetooth proximity. Some of what has changed in the last six years is 
we've gotten a much better sense of what the, the limitations of call detail records are and, and how much more work we need to do to, to, to make it a technical solution that works. Um, and I think that, you know, we've also seen a lot of the apps fail in really big and public ways because they are at, uh, because they're consumer facing because you they're user facing so call detail records happen essentially their, their analysis and exchange happens mostly behind closed doors between public health institutions and mobile networks uh, international organizations things like that um, domestic governments obviously um, whereas here what we're talking about is needing the public to participate by downloading and using and recognizing and in integrating into their daily life, some part of, of, a, of a mobile phone application. So I think that what the public is getting to see in a much more granular way here are the limitations of a technology, right? An app crash, apps crash, right? Whether it's because of, it's delivering you dinner or it's telling you about your medical results, apps crash. And so I think that one of the things that we're really finding here is what things we think are okay to do via apps and what things you know feel like an appropriate use of technology versus throwing a random technology at a problem and sort of hoping that we figure out how to make it impactful after the fact and i think we've seen that happen in both responses but yeah scale is the main difference here it's happening globally so uh you know uh, also, I guess other factors like, uh, you know, the disease is different. It's got uh, different incubation times. There are people who don't have symptoms. They get symptoms after 14 days, uh, you know, and also the fact that, you know, the whole, uh, the whole Ebola thing took place in Africa, you know, which for most people is like, does not exist, you know, it's out of their bandwidth of viewing. And while well, now this has kind of come home, you know, it, it's, it's there everywhere. So, uh, I guess that was, well, is, is that also a big qualitative factor, I, I suspect? Yeah, well, so a, a couple of things, just, and as someone who's, who's run a business in Nairobi for a long time, I definitely uh, understand both the visibility of, of Africa and, and, and um, that it's very complicated in, in that regard. Uh, I, I think that we, um, you, you start off with the most, to me, one of the most important points. We actually know comparatively a lot about Ebola, com certainly compared to COVID. And what we're seeing happening in this response is that the science isn't really all the way there yet, right? We've seen big public institutions shift in the advice that they gave from the WHO. A number of national governments, for example, have changed their position on whether or not uh, masks are important. I think it's pretty clearly proven at this point that they are. Um, but you may remember that at the beginning, a lot of people were talking about transmission on surfaces. And that's why masks didn't seem important is because we were talking about it as, a, as, as transmitted in a completely different way. If you're approaching that from a technology perspective, what you're doing is you're saying, here's the known science about this disease. Here are ways that we can model aspects of that known science using data that we have access to and proxy it for or provide some increased capability, some increased insight. And what, what we're seeing is that actually when the science is as underdeveloped as it is around COVID and when you really need a huge amount of data, when you're trying to figure out transmission, like how it transmits alongside who it transmits to, I mean, as it sort of always happens, but is much, much more difficult here than it was in Ebola. Um, you're starting to look at how does the app produce data that's useful? And so I think that, the, you know, to your point, proximity is the, is the thing that we use as the, as the indicator right now. And proximity, when we're measuring through Bluetooth, and in, in most of the apps are using some form of Bluetooth at this point. Um, and it's a weak indicator. Right? Like if you're wearing a mask and you're outside and it's, a, it's potentially a very different risk threshold to being inside or not wearing a mask. So there are all of these contextual factors that actually make the technology design quite experimental. And I think that that's one thing that's really similar is we're seeing the, the, the turn to technology, to experimental technology as a sort of very hopeful, but not very scientific approach to solving the problem. So, you know, why, since you mentioned hopeful and experimental, one argument that I keep hearing in favor of tech solutions, you know, specifically to contact tracing in India, I hear it all the time is that, 
even if it does not always work all the time, it can make things worse. You know, uh, so, uh, you know, why is this a wrong argument? Uh, you know, uh, could, you, could you just dwell on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I think that it's a really common instinct during times of disaster to think, well, it's so bad, we just have to have something. And as, as, you know, as a set of humanitarian responders tried that for a long time, and it turns out it's what you can do quite a bit of harm. You know, um, what we're finding is that the problems of technology are the problems of technology. Uh, and so when they're known, when we go into a new setting we know, and introduce the technology, we know we're bringing the challenges, things like interoperability, things like energy, access to energy, the, certainly the very real economic considerations that go into various device adoption, various amounts of internet usage, various amounts of comfort and skill in digital spaces. So there are lots and lots of known differences that digital tools amplify. But what we're seeing is that I think we don't have a very good sense for how those, those problems map into how much we know about what value those technologies will really deliver. So we know the problems. The, the benefits are also very known sometimes. We know that communication is faster and that when communication is faster, response can be faster. But what I think that we're, what we're really trying to say, and I think this is also is, is similar to what happened in Liberia and, uh, during the Ebola outbreak, our rush to do something means that we become pretty bad at distinguishing what good things to do are and what bad things to do are. And so what we do is we waste a lot of time and a lot of resources and a lot of good energy focusing on really edge case unlikely solutions instead of doing the things that we know are valuable, right? If every person who is downloading an app or was, was, was thinking about how to participate through technology was instead focusing on PPE production or supporting members of their community in need or you know, investing in resilience infrastructure. I think we'd see a very different response, both qualitatively and quantitatively to COVID. But I think that because we're focusing on technology and because we're focusing on surveillance instead of you know, engaging with people and meeting them where they are, we're seeing a policy architecture emerge that can really punish you for something as, as you know, something as innocent as living a normal life and as, as you were instructed to, you know? And so I think that it's a really, it's a really difficult context to be hoping for technology to solve what we know to be very entrenched kind of entrenched in knowable challenges. And I think that's what makes it experimental. And it's also why we need to have, why we need to protect our protections, essentially. If, the, the quick example, I'm sorry, this is longer than I meant it to be, but uh, well, when you look at vaccine trials, right? We don't go from, I invented a chemical to let's deploy it on millions of people because there's a couple steps we need in the middle to make sure that, it, that it's good, that it works, that it doesn't cause harms we don't know about the human trial process gets compressed during emergencies, right? We, we see very large upticks in prioritization. We see reductions in administrative barriers. We see lots and lots of, of, of energy go into conducting those experiments rigorously. But we do that because we know that the cost of, of getting a vaccine wrong is also huge, right? And so what's important is that when the science, go, when we do speak to something with the weight of science, that it has that validation, it has that experimentation process behind it. And, and we're able to speak to it with that degree of clarity. And otherwise what we get is a lot of garbage medicine that hurts people. And so you can, you can very much hurt people by not, by not engaging with the substance or potential for harm in an intervention. Yeah, you know, so uh, it, it's actually good you mentioned the vaccine and the vaccine trial, uh, because, you know, just to bring it back down to earth that it's, this app is kind of not even, it's like a vaccine, which is being deployed on people like a live experiment. So, I mean, in, in India, it's not mandatory by law yet, but uh, it is kind of mandatory as in compulsory for many things, you know. Uh, if you're a civil servant in many government offices now, you have to go, you, you, you know, you have to install this app by government order. Uh, there were gas station attendants who had to forcibly install it, you know, otherwise they would probably be fired, you know. 
people in those contexts, they don't ask. They just do what they are told, many of them. So uh, it's a kind of force down from the top, you know, that, that kind of idea. So it has implications, you know, uh, like in the context of a vaccine trial. In this case, if the app flagged you wrongly or rightly, you could lose your job in many cases, you know, and uh, your wife could lose her job because you got flagged uh, as a uh, positive and you, know, you went home and your wife, because she's in proximity to you, she got flagged with a red flag, even though you were completely okay, you know. So there was a case uh, just from a couple of days ago. I mean, if, I, if you just search on the Indian internet, you find dozens of cases like this, you know. Uh, I think many people, most of these people don't even come on Twitter. There was one case, I'll just read out, you know, the guy is called Jemin and the case was reported he was flagged as uh, positive because uh, somebody got tested for COVID and uh, either by accident or by, uh, or by you know, or on purpose, somebody put a fake number and that number turned out to be this poor fellow's, uh, Jamin's number. So when he installed the app, it showed him as COVID positive and uh, which was a shock to him because he had never installed the app and, uh, you know, he couldn't understand and then he he has essentially gone and flagged uh, the app people on Twitter who have responded by saying, let me read out the reply because you need to be a scientist to understand this reply. You know, just imagine this is a common citizen. It has been reported here that some test lab has wrongly entered the phone number due to which app status has turned red. Since Arogya Situ gets data from ICMR through APIs, it is essential that necessary correction is done at the back end after verification. Imagine that, you know, the guy got flagged as COVID. He, he might, you know, he, uh, his office has probably told him don't come to work anymore, you know, 15 days. And, you know, now it's the era where if you ask to stay at home and not come or whatever, you know, they, uh, you know, <laughs> they could despise you. It's, you're, you're touching on three things that I, I, at least, but three things that I think are really, really important as themes, right? One is that this information is not a notification in an app. Your, like your health status when it comes to, most of, our, most of the way that public health information, health is regulated, means that you have to be in a position to receive care or get expert advice. You have to be around a professional in many instances to receive health news. Obviously it's different in a lot of places, but the main point is that we recognize that being told that you might have a life altering illness is not common information. And that when we deliver it to someone in a way that we know will impact their lives, we can't take that as casually as we would take a notification about your dinner being ready or on its way or something like that. And I think that that, that fundamental kind of humanity and care piece is a really important element of, of not getting too swept up into the role of technology. But I think that, you know, this, a second and really, really important piece of what you're saying is that the second that it is often second order effects that make things like apps extremely dangerous, right? It's not as you're describing whether the app is correct or not. It wasn't, but that's sort of immaterial because what is happening is now a number of employers are making decisions based on that. Like you're saying, your access to, to revenue, your access to the economy, your access to well-being in many instances is going to be gate kept by this thing that we know mostly doesn't work. And this is how, this is really often how it happens. This is often the, the kind of main set of issues. It's these second order effects. So it's really, e it's not, it, is not, it is not easy enough to convince a government not to abuse the technology, but it is comparatively easier than convincing an insurer not to factor in COVID mitigation around the way that they engage with businesses. So what you start to see is that there are these infrastructures that become very risk avoidant. And the fact that it's a probabilistic risk, which we would not, which, which generally speaking, don't tolerate from employers related to how they engage with the labor. But the fact that it's not certain doesn't even necessarily matter in a lot of contexts. And so I think that we're seeing, you know, this, this, the second order effects of this are huge. And then I think the third piece, and I just wanna, because you did such a beautiful job of explaining it in the way that you told that story, in the way that you brought the use case up, but our engagement, our accountability 
through these systems. You know, the ability to track down an error and to be told, oh, it's like it's a back down, it's, it's an API problem. And on the other end of this impenetrable terms of service, they should be upholding a guarantee that you will not enforce in any court. You know, there's a real, there's a real scary indignity to being given the runaround to make sure, you know, when, when you're, what you're trying to figure out is, why do you think I have a life altering condition that is affecting the, you know, a pandemic? That's the kind of thing that you should have to be pretty sure about before you start telling, telling people they have things. And, and the, the complexities that go into accountability when what you're dealing with is like a technology or a data supply chain, as opposed to say a doctor or a public health services provider is a really, really different it's, it's, a, it's a fundamentally different construction and it's, it's scary to me. I, I, you know, I would, I don't know how to not, it would be, it's very unsettling to not know how to verify information that you receive through official channels about your health status. You know, you know in one sense, it is actually far more damaging than, you know, actually taking a test for COVID and uh, it gives you a false positive. At least you can go and retake the test just to re-verify, you know, whether that, because you can see on the box of the test that what is the false positive rate, what's the false negative rate, the app does not have anything on it like that. They don't have any data, they don't have anything. So, I mean, it's not just the Indian app, but it's the case with all these apps all over the world. Uh, I think that's one of the pieces that, that people really haven't brought up enough is that the heads of almost every major program who have run contact tracing apps are saying they don't make much difference. So the heads of the program in Iceland, South Korea, Singapore, South Dakota, you know, across a pretty broad range of, of contexts, all of the early indicators is that it doesn't make much, much actual difference. But the one thing that I think does make a difference, and it's the point that you're, that you're really focusing on, I think, and, and well, is we talk about these notifications as though you might get one, right? Like you're going to get a notification and then you're going to make a decision. What if you get a hundred? What if you keep getting a hundred no matter what you do, what, no matter what you change about your lifestyle? What if there are ways in which you can't change your life that still expose you to COVID, right? Our ability, you know, our focus on this is a probabilistic risk score means that we don't engage with the humanity of people who, who have to, we treat it as a risk, not as solving a, a problem for a person. And I think that that's, when we, when we start risk scoring health, health quality and, and health status, I mean, as we already do in many instances, of course, but in, in this way, and as this large of a gatekeeper, it's, it has a, a bunch of very concerning second order effects. And, and you know, there's also the case that, you know, not everybody in the country has a smartphone. Uh, there are many people I know myself who just have feature phones or don't have phones at all. And then there's also the expectation that everybody's got to have the internet. And I, uh, you know, I read in your uh, uh, paper on Ebola that some American billionaire came and flew in and gave thousands of mobile, you know, mobile phones to everybody, but then people had to recharge and getting cards, being able to afford cards, recharge uh, for data access, was was uh, was very difficult for many. So uh, you know, I uh, you know, I don't know what you have to say on that, but uh, you know, for sure, it's it's. I think that it's a it's an endemic problem to short term thinking, right? Is that a lot of times what crises do is they reveal fragility, and it is, it's a it's optimistic in many ways, if if not somewhat naive in others, to think that you know, the absence of a device is the problem, right? And, and technology solutions to international disasters, to, to, to domestic disasters, you know, very much have to draw on the capacity of the people and the services that they're connecting. And so there are these limitations that I think technology doesn't always do a great job of, of explaining or reflecting. And I think that, um, you know, smartphone adoption has always been a barrier. It's why I work in this math. Uh, but I think that, you know, for the most part, what we're trying to do is, is make it as accessible as possible. And, and what we're learning, mobile phones obviously are variably accessible. And, but, the, but, but COVID susceptibility is not, right? And so what we're finding is that the, the structural um, 
the structural challenges that get it that, that create the unevenness of mobile phone adoption are also creating re real fragility and unevenness in the way that people engage um, with the response. I don't know whether or not I've lost a shoke. Ah, welcome back. Hi. Sorry. I don't no, know no what worry. happened there. Yeah. I you missed you missed nothing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but yeah, no, I think that, that what we're essentially what we're seeing is that there is no kind of billionaire act of, of one time generosity that is going to to fill or or level or change the underlying circumstances in ways that that affect or really meaningfully change, you know, our ability to respond to COVID over a long period of time, because those are those are structural and systemic problems that need real attention. So, you know, since you talk about structural and systemic problems, uh, you know, one thing that is very different between India and let's say Korea or China is they have public health systems. You know, they have public, they have functional public health systems. They have infant mortality rates, which are like say in Europe or in the US, maybe better than the US. Uh, and they have uh, public health care, you know, uh, you don't need private insurance to get safe health care. So, uh, you know, in India, somehow it's very bizarre to me that people think the app is an answer to not having a public health system. So isn't that the case? I mean, with every other country who have handled COVID to some extent and where uh, the app was just an addendum to the presence of hospitals and PPEs and masks and uh, hospitals and doctors and staff who knew what they were doing. Uh, is that the case? It's it's hard to argue with. I, you know, as an American, um, we don't have a public health system really. Um, I mean, certainly not one that 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 meets people's needs the way that you're describing. So definitely, and, and given the state of our, of our response, you know, it certainly bears out as a theory. I think that, um, yeah, I think that, I mean, it, it is true of, of public health systems specifically, and it is also true of collective support structures broadly. Um, and I think that, you know, what we're seeing is that, leaders that that have acted in a limited but explain you know transparent way have had more effective engagement uh people that have shied away from politicizing making it a political issue and, and focused on the science and the public health nature of it uh have, have been more successful but i think to your to your sort of specific point public health systems and social infrastructures and safety nets are why you know this is why they exist and i think that we're seeing both because of the privatization of a number of, of vital industries, but as well as sort of our focus on individual action and our and, and individualism, you know, individualism over collective action in many ways, you, you're seeing a lot of different factors, a lot of different social safety nets play out, um, so, social design infrastructures. But I would say that I think that giving people healthcare is pretty obviously the right thing to do. And certainly when the entire health of the world depends on it, as it seemingly always does. So one of the things I am finding really interesting is I was doing some work recently with some folks in public health and you're seeing a real culture change in the narrative of international debate about public health, which of course there has always been a strong kind of pro public medicine case but i think you're now seeing this become a really galvanizing moment because it is so clear how interconnected everybody's health is in this in this pandemic i think you're on i got you on mute sorry uh, one thing i just wanted to touch upon again is uh you know this use of apps and you know this belief that tech is going to solve everything uh you know, I don't get it. Why do, you know, why are people somehow blind to the fact that if the hospitals are not there, if uh, the PPE supply chain is not there, if the masks are not there, it's not going to work if there's an app. But somehow I see that tendency a lot in people I know, you know, this app will help me. Uh, you know, I don't know, is it connected to being able to order food on an app and it comes home at the press of a button? So maybe 
the app is going to wish away COVID and build whatever infrastructure is there uh, required for it. I mean, I don't get it. You know, maybe you have a, a, a perspective on that. I, I have a perspective on it. I don't know, I don't know how, how right it is, but um, I think at the individual level, it's really understandable to want to believe that something is happening, right? And I, I think we all want that during times of great upheaval. We all want someone to have a plan. We all want there to be something that will fix this. And I think that what we're seeing right now is that in a lot of places, in a lot of instances, there just isn't, there's not a plan. Um, in, in some places, that's speaking for my own, my own country, there are elements of our leadership that, that, feel like, that seem to feel like actively against our response. And so I think that there's a, there's a real, where there's a void, right? Irrational hope sometimes steps in. And I think that, you know, it's also not really fair to put this on the individual. There is a lot of money that goes into building surveillance technologies that then needs new use cases, right? New growth arenas. And we're certainly seeing COVID apps become that. We're already seeing data breaches. We're already seeing commercial contact tracing apps that are selling data back to advertisers. You know, this is the same kind of churning tech industry machine that existed before COVID. And, you know, whenever another major issue arises, I suspect we'll see a lot of technologies, you know, a lot of surveillance practices and technologies pitched as, as the sort of solution there too. So I think that to your point, and, and just, I think that I, I, there's a lot of individual, I, I really hear what you're saying on the individual level. I know a lot of people really struggling and, and, and also who think that, that the app really might do it. And people don't really wanna say no when there's so much hype and so much public enthusiasm. But I would also say that there's political value to this and that's sort of full circle. That, that, that person's hope, that person's irrational hope that someone is doing something that will solve this is also a government's kind of cushion from accountability, right? We can all be going to government and saying, we know that PPE isn't there. We know we need better hospital beds. We know we need, you know, uh, all kinds of healthcare system capacity that is very not technology driven. Um, and, I, and I think that if we're doing both, then maybe great, but, but you know, all the way back to the beginning, I don't think that it makes any sense for us to be pinning this amount of hope on something so unvalidated, so unproven, so experimental. And I think we should expect more responsibility and more accountability from both the corporate actors and the public actors who are lining up to launch these technologies without a really clear impact statement, without a really clear view to, to actually making a difference in the response. And often without any real articulation of what success would look like, failure would look like, or when and under what conditions they'll shut it down. And to me, those are all things that more mature industries take as preconditions for even getting involved. And so I think that, you know, a lot of what we're seeing is that this is an opportunity for technology to grow up a little bit, right? And to, to be able to, to build its research and development infrastructure, to be able to speak to its value proposition in ways that are more certain and, and less experimental. No, I mean, to me, it is very interesting that uh, you know, like the tech to battle COVID is really ancient tech. I mean, if you think about it, quarantines go back to the Mosaic law in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, the mask goes back to the Black Plague, you know, people uh, putting on masks to keep diseases away. Even PPEs, if you see uh, doctors in Venice, I mean, the whole Venice festival is about wearing some kind of mask with uh, some kind of filters inside to keep the smells out. So. You know, to me, uh, isn't that really, that is all that together is more effective than app-based contact tracing. I mean, to me, it is very bizarre. You have AIs, robots, self-driving cars, but we don't have this. I can buy a robot on the market that can make me 10,000 masks in an hour. Yeah, so, you know, so uh, to me, just to give a very laughable example, but, uh, you know, to me, isn't that, hasn't COVID really exposed the failure of tech to a large extent. I mean, they were focusing on the wrong things uh, to, to a large extent. It's such an interesting question. I think that it's, in many ways, it's, it's less about, is it a failure of tech and is it a failure of our ability to, to, to remain kind of self-possessed adults in the face of tech, 
right? And I, I mean that at the individual level and at the collective level, because you're, you're right that a lot of what, what we're talking about is an approach to developing something new, some moonshot, when in fact, what we know more often is that the simple things that require work and discipline do the job, you know? And, and this isn't new in public health, right? Like we all, um, we all I don't think any, at diet and exercise are new medical advice to anybody, right? And yet in a lot of contexts, obesity is a major issue. And that's not to say that that's just a question of discipline by any stretch of the means. It's a way of saying that putting personal responsibility and, and even knowable treatments isn't necessarily the solution, right? We have to create an environment in which and a more complicated environment that involves things like social safety nets. So yes, I, I basically, I completely agree that this idea that we're going to invent our way out of every problem is, is, a, is a dangerous one for the way that we define social safety nets. You, you know, I mean, I speak to doctors and I speak to, you know, uh, medical practitioners, you know, people in this space, but they got it from the beginning. You know, they understood, you know, they even told me what's an app going to do. I need a mask or, you know, I need a PPE. But somehow, as you say, you know, perhaps there is an element of making people happy with an app like this and feel a bit safer while, you know, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I do see your point very well there that it's there's just a, a tool. There's an old presentation that I, I used to give that had a two slide progression that comes up a lot. And I just, I'm only bringing it up. The first is sort of like what science fiction promises us. And it's this painting of this beautiful utopia. We're all in flying cars. The earth is green, you know, and, and bountiful. It's just, it is a vision, right? And then it's, the next slide is, and what, and, and what did tech actually give us? And it's a room full of people sitting with virtual reality headsets on, right? And I think that, this is a lot of what we see. This is a lot of what is important to be, this is why critical thinking around tech is so important, right? Is that tech is very good at giving us the appearance of things, but it is not always as good at giving us complicated or difficult things to build. And I think that we have to be really careful about what we assume tech can build based on what it shows us. And so I think that what we're seeing here in a lot of instances is it is a, a a palliative. It is a. It's a nice thing. It's a. It. It makes you feel better. Maybe that that there is some technology approach or some some tracking approach that will be progress. But I. I think that, um, you know. Emergency is a very difficult time to be irrational and hopeful. And uh, the other thing they've done, at least in the Indian contact tracing aspect, is uh, because they got a lot of pushback. They said uh, we'll do it open source. And what they did was they just took the front end of the application and they made that open source. And, uh, uh, you know, okay, I have personally, to me, the whole concept of the app itself is not functional. So making it open source, how does it solve the problem? I mean, uh, you know, you might have a different view on that. Uh, is it of any benefit here, you know, in this centralized contact tracing context? I think that open source is necessary, but not sufficient for something that requires this amount of public trust. I think that it's fair for people to want to understand the code and that there are a number of really important sort of security standard testing and, and, and generally understanding and, and capacity building reasons to open source code. And so I think doing that is, is positive, um, but it's not sufficient. Right. It's and, and the license of a code is not or even, you know, being able to understand code is not the same thing as uh, the license of the data or, or you know, the, the operational security of the parties involved in managing the data throughout that supply chain. I mean, you mentioned, you know, the gentleman had several different services he would have to interact with in order to understand his COVID diagnosis and, and presumably each one of them have terms of service agreements and legal architecture. So I don't think that open source, open sourcing the code does not solve the problem of, is this a good app? It doesn't demonstrate a positive public health impact, but it may help some, some proactive folks go in and limit harm or make sure or reduce some of the things that could go wrong, which of course is a positive thing. So basically open source cannot turn a bad product into a good one. That's, that's, that's what you're saying. It can't turn an ineffective product into an effective one. 
into an effective product. I, uh, there's one question that I keep getting from people is that, you know, so it seemed to work in China and in South Korea, you know, this uh, whole business of using apps and technologies, you know, they've done it there in China and Korea. So why aren't we, why isn't it good for us? So, uh, you know. The shortest answer is because they shut down when they get bad news, right? The, okay. even, even in the best of circumstances, a COVID app can only give leadership information about rate of infection, right? Leadership in South Korea, and in China and in a number of places have chosen based on that information to shut, to, to, to resume lockdown and to in, engage test and trace sort of programming. So to your, you know, to your point, I think that there's a lot to be said for health system capacity, which is a, a, a big deal. Um, but I, I also think that there's a lot to be said for leadership that is willing to transparently and frequently shut down in case of, of breaches of containment. I think that that's what allows that. And, and so where you have governments that are unwilling to take action to shut down or, or, or are unable to really compel containment, um, there is no app that fixes that. And even, uh, I, you know, I guess testing is a big part of that because I saw that Beijing alone has a testing capacity of 1 million a day. So, I, I, you know, I don't think they're doing one million tests a day in India, you know, leave alone, uh, you know, forget about a city the size of Beijing, the whole of India, they aren't doing a million tests a day. So I, 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 I do understand what you're saying. Um, there's a question here from uh, Dibij uh, Joshi. Uh, how do we assess uh, voluntariness of consent in a situation where you are being sold a bridge to health, particularly by the government. If you wanted mass participation in some sort of widespread digital contact tracing trial, uh, what's the way to ensure informed consent? I love that question. Um, so there is a whole space of humanitarian research ethics. And one of the things that's really fascinating about apps is that they saw that they can solve one of the major challenges around consent which is that that anything that acts as a bridge to a system theoretically remains up so you can continuously get new consent um, the way that that people's rights are, are typically protected in large-scale and emergency experiments is through a heightened degree of transparency so the people who are performing that experiment very typically have to tell you quite a bit about both the methodology, what it is doing, you know, what they're testing, and how it works in your body, what things you need to look out for. They do a significant amount of increased monitoring. So if you participate in an experiment, you get an elevated level of care, typically, or at least an elevated level of sort of mon you know, monitoring and awareness by the public health provider. And importantly, <clears throat> research ethics also impose um, some, some requirements around necessity, proportionality, and accountability. So essentially, it is illegal in most places to do unnecessary or wildly disproportionate experiments on humans. Um, and you sort of always have a due process right to leave. And so one of the things that I think is really important and really different here, right, is that we're seeing a government launch an app and in any, and to in any way make it compulsory is to exert a type of government power that is typically only available during emergencies. So a government normally cannot force you to download an app without a very compelling public process. And here what we're saying is a government may, may force it. And even if they don't force it, they may create a set of conditions like letting your employer require it that functionally or constructively force it. And those kinds of, those kinds of, um, those are the kinds of policy protections that when one is designing an experiment as an experiment, that the structure of the process, generally speaking, you can work through some of those concerns and you also work through those accountabilities and you take on those roles. It's, it's, so there is a lot of, there's a lot of progress to make just in what we know, right? That's not to suggest that that will form that consent is perfect. I think that the question is also really pulling at this idea that if it's a bridge to hell in the middle of a pandemic, is it consent, right? It's in law, it's called cohesion, so, or adhesion, sorry. Um, and that, but that is essentially that you are, you make an agreement against your will. 
And, and there's a really compelling argument that in humanitarian response, any consent that you give is basically being given against your will because it's being done under duress. It's being done so that you can get access to something really basic that you need, um, something really fundamental and vital. And so I think that that is a broader question, which is really difficult and really contextual to answer. And it's why those principles and the sort of systems that regulate and oversee human experimentation are so important um, and, and also uh, play such a role when we do things like vital science during emergencies. <clears throat> So in a sense, uh, you know, just uh, you know, just correct me if I'm wrong. So inflicting an app like this on people, making it mandatory uh, in the middle of an emergency, is kind of like uh, doing a challenge trial with a vaccine. You know, uh, like you know, in a in a challenge trial, you basically inject people with the disease, and then you give them the vaccine. You first inject people with a vaccine that you don't know if it works or not, and then you give them the disease. And they are kind of a live experiment, the, these people. It's a way to speed up vaccine trials, done probably only in uh, very adverse situations or in countries where they do it on prisoners on death row or something like that. So uh, is that a fair The analogy? Chinese military is doing this now. The Chinese military is, has started on, on vaccine trials, on human vaccine trials. And so it's a really interesting set of questions, right, is, is how do we... What is the consent there? I mean, presumably as a military officer, they have a very different sort of due process footprint to what you might expect to an average person in that same context. Uh, there's uh, just another thing I wanted to touch upon, which is, uh, you know, I, if I read Indian media, for example, but even if you read uh, media in other countries, uh, the general trend has been not to understand, not to try and understand the tech, but to reflect the same biases in the sense that the tech is great, it's going to help us. So I see it only in very selective journalists or, you know, in, in very selective parts of the media where there was critical questioning of tech from the beginning. Now there's a lot more people waking up to it because there are people reporting issues with it and so on, but it's still not enough. You know, there seems to be an implicit belief. It's okay. Yeah, I, I definitely, as someone, yeah, I, I definitely hear you that I, there's a real strong, there seems to be a very strong, uh, I, what I usually call it is inevitabilism. It's this idea that technology is inevitable. And so therefore we must find ways to accommodate it as opposed to technology is, you know, we can say no, which we can, of course. Uh, but I think that, you know, um, I think that the, the over-reliance on tech creates really big blind spots. And there's some of the ones that you've been touching on, you know, throughout. There are older, there's older tech that works, that we know it works. There are solutions here. We, we know what it means to, to invest in social safety nets. So there's a lot of things that I think, um, a lot of misdirection that goes in the direction of technology. And I think that we're, we're starting to see productively, as you say, we're starting to see a lot more, a, a lot more critical diversity in the way that tech is getting covered. But I think that we're also starting to see the failures of our protections, right? I, we, um, for example, whether you think about your main data rights coming from data protection, as some places do, or from human rights, as other places do, or property rights, uh, as is popular in some places, you know, there, there are a number of ways in which uh, people are trying to engage with how we control, how we, how we get control. And I think that what we're seeing is that it's, we don't have a, a, a set of protections that are future proof, right? Privacy ultimately will not prevent the kinds of harms that a COVID app creates. And, and, and privacy alone is important. And it is a set of protections, you know, that, that we want, that lots of cultures want to carry forward. I say this from the United States, there's a lot of patchwork, you know, a lot of patchwork efforts to build a privacy law here. But I think that the, the thing to say is that not only do we have this kind of problem with um, the, the means of control, but we also kind of, ha we have this problem with, with that our, our defenses aren't, aren't future-proof, our defenses don't, and so the, the tools that we have to kind of manage these things, emergency powers are always going to be bigger than privacy, for example. So we need to be able to think about what do digital emergency powers look like? 
right? Should a government be, be able to compel you to, to download an app? Why? Uh, and, and under what conditions and under what sort of accountabilities. And I, those are the ways that we define protections in most other, you know, that's the, the way that we limit government power during times of emergency in other domains. And so it's just from, from my perspective, and I'm sorry, I acknowledge this is a bit of a tangent, but um, just to say that I think that we, it's really important for us as people who are concerned about these issues to be thinking critically and, and creatively about how how we might protect the protect these interests and these rights in the future, not just what exists now. I, you know, just on that context, since you mentioned the future and uh, you know emergency powers, so you know, it's there's a possibility that this pandemic is not going away soon. You know, it's going to be there for the next year, for the next two years, for the next three years. We don't know. So, is there a context? keeping that in mind where uh, you know uh, where you know what's the context where a techno solution could actually be useful and uh, you know like you know is uh, you know i mean in terms of should it have a sunset date should it have a clear sunset date you know what's the context for it it's not forever does it require a sunset date do we need laws uh, that mandate its precise use of every specific bit of technology. If there's an app that needs a law controlling it, what is its specific use? And what happens to people who are flagged by the app? Do they lose their rights? Do they keep their rights on? I mean, is that, uh, is that something, uh, you know, what would work? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I think we're, to, you know, to your point, I think that, um, you touched on something that's really near and dear to my heart at the beginning, which is that we need a diplomatic capacity around digital issues. And, and, and um, I, I, I haven't seen the infrastructure arise for it. Obviously there are international organizations and many of them have important and relevant mandates, but really specifically each of, each of these countries, everyone who is experiencing COVID in one way or another is making decisions about how it will respond, what standards it will hold travelers to, what types of technology and monitoring we expect, what type, as you say, what type of wind down, what are the conditions, is it only for citizens, is it for everyone who's resident, is it for, how does it apply to different populations, how do we apply that same set of conter, you know, concerns for people who don't meet the same technology needs uh, or the, main, the same technology requirements. Um, you know, I think that there's a, I, I think that what we're looking at in a lot of these instances is not that this is we're going to get to a techno solutionist response. And in many ways, if we do, it is sort of a failure of all of the other systems, which is ter you know which, which we don't want. So, technology, generally speaking, is you know is it's a marginal solution. It improves the rate and speed of things, but it won't fix political disagreements. It can't fix intransigency. And ultimately we're not going to predictively model our way around the need to provide basic human care to people when they need it. You know, in, in, especially during a pandemic when all of our, our individual healths are so, so inextricably linked. So I think that Rather than think about what does it look like for this technology to work, I think it's you know more useful to think about how how are we able to participate in deciding what we want this response to look like, and some of that is of course the things that we can create, but a lot of it I think ha we have to find other avenues to participate that aren't just I'm going to invent something right. We need to be able to find vehicles of participation, we need to be able to find vehicles of collective action. Some of those will be technological, most of them probably won't, right? I mean, lots of gatherings have nothing to do with technology, thankfully, uh, I'm told. I've, I've attended at least one, I'm sure. But the, the point is, is that, you know, that I think that the most successful thing that we can do in the narrative around techno solutionism is to recenter the debate about solution outside of technology and to reorient that technology is in support of a broader and more holistic solution than it is a solution in and of itself. And from my perspective, the places where I see technology driving the most conflict or driving the most potential for, for bad outcomes 
are really in need of governance. They're because we don't have any space to have conversations about political speech and biosurveillance. Or, you know, what we just have are, are people who are great at, at analyzing it and talking about it and writing about it, but we don't have participatory decision-making spaces. And I'll just end with, with this piece. I got into technology in the very beginning because of access to justice. And actually, um, India was one of my first use cases because um, the, or my, one of my first sort of examples and, and concerns, because the backlog of civil cases is so large in many instances that it can be difficult to process, just administratively process law. And, and so in the United States, this is also true. Um, there are a huge, a huge backlog and a huge unevenness to, to the way that people are able to protect their rights. And, you know, to take the example, the very human example that we gave, you know, if that person wanted to demand accountability, they would presumably have to get access to a court, they'd have to put together a case, they would have to, you know, fund that case, wait the amount of time it took to litigate that case. And then they might not even, you know, by then, if, if whatever the disposition is, even still matters, you know, then it might be some small amount of financial reward, it might be some small amount of, um, you know, of, of it, you might get a rule change, but it really depends and it's pretty unlikely. So, I mean, as I know that, that you, you know, you've got a, a deep experience in legal technology, I came to Frontline by starting the Frontline Legal Project, but I think that the, the reason that I focus on that, and I think that one of the things that I think is critical to, to, to think about with any COVID app is that any app that launches should also have a dispute resolution system embedded in it. Right, that we should be building technologies, not only expecting you know, that we'll take them to court if, if they get it wrong, but that they build that capacity into the system itself so that participants can shape the rules as they go. And I think you get a lot further that way. Of course, governance design gets more complicated, but it's that dispute resolution piece. It's that how do we make sure that the things that we're creating take responsibility for and give people access to remediation in the kinds of problems that they cause, not just you know, turn it off. And I think that as we recognize that complexity, we're getting deeper and deeper into understanding the need for digital governance. And, and that's really how most of my work ties together. Okay. No, I think, uh, you know, that's a great way to, uh, you know, to basically close the conversation because what you mentioned about the app being like a one-way traffic at the moment is, makes no sense. I mean, if you, if you, uh, if you fail an actual COVID test in the medical space, you can go and retake it. So in real life, when you get really tested, you can go and retake the test. But in the app, it's not there. You know, that's fundamental lack of thinking. I, you know, I don't know how it can be modeled like that. Uh, so yeah. So you know, thank you, thank you very much for this really enlightening discussion. I believe I've learned a lot myself. You know, just talking to you and uh, you know, uh, you know, talking about your experience, and uh, I'm sure the audience has also learned a lot. Uh, you know, out of this. Uh, I, I, uh, incidentally, I forgot to mention Karana. So I just want to uh, thank Karana for putting this together. They are a group of uh, active people in the, you know, they were originally people active in the Aadhaar space, and now it's gone beyond that. It's uh, mostly in the digital rights space, and it's a brilliant bunch of people. I learn something from them every day. So I just want to shout out to them, uh, everybody, you know, uh, Srinivas, Zena, all the people who put this together. Thank you. Absolutely. And also just to say that, that the work that you're doing and the, the context of India and it's the, the convergence of public and the public services and infrastructure and technology is so incredibly important, both globally uh, and, and domestically, obviously. It's just, it's, I, I feel like I learn from the work of this group and, and this, this um, the group of people all the time, just, so, just to say thank you from somewhere very far away. John, uh, if I can take two minutes for one more question. Uh, so there's an important aspect, I think, uh, uh, we did have a discussion around this in the past uh, on, What's happening in India is that the government uh, is using crisis at every moment. Like there's a lot of talk around disaster capitalism around the world right now, especially with the push of 5G in US and driverless cars and this whole idea of contactless technology systems that we need to build that's being pushed by everyone, right? So we are also witnessing a similar trend within India where uh, the government's now trying to promote uh, health responses through technology, right? Through telemedicine and stuff. And uh, 
the contact tracing app kinda is going to stay around and they're trying to build data trust. Uh, this is something that you have really worked upon. Uh, so if we are building some of this based on the current crisis, how do you think these things should proceed? I mean, that your organization, Digital Public works a lot on that, so. Yeah, th thank you for the question. Um, I, I think that it, it gets, you know, I, I, I'm worried or wondering how much we're going to see a kind of wave of legal solutionism really similar to, to technical, you know, techno solutionism, where people really confuse instrumentation for good, you know, good or equitable governance. And so I think that data trusts are one important, they, you know, they build on fiduciary theory uh, and law. There, there's a lot of useful tools available through trusts uh, and through accountability and transparency, the way that trusts create. Um, but they are an instrumentation, right? And, and so they are also very, you know, trusts have been used to manage assets, both in front of government attention and away from government attention globally for a very long time. So I think that it is it's in some ways very encouraging to hear a government recognize the complexity of, you know, of, of the social complexity of asking a population to engage in some of these services or to build into this kind of techn technical or digital in infrastructure. But I, I think that you have to look at the governance design of each of those trusts and you have to think about what rights does it really give the people who are reflected in that data, who are using that data, who could be harmed by that data. And so it's, the, it's really the governance design piece. And then to the extent that that governance can be accessible through that technology stack. I think that's the, you know, that's the other piece of that is that you need the, the mechanisms of dispute resolution and, and, and changing the system to be available at the point where the person experiences that. And so if that's through technology, then that has to be in the technology itself. So in a lot of ways, um, I'm really hopeful about, you know, things like telemedicine are very old. They obviously happened long before mobile phones and, and, and in some ways, you know, are underexploited and in some ways are overexploited. But I think that, so rather than, from, from my perspective, and of course you will have, have picked up on this as a bias of mine by now, but I think it's most important to map the power or map the, the relationship to power uh, mediated by a technology than to focus on the technology itself. And, and so when, when you're focusing on what rights does this change or afford me or not afford someone else? And what issues does that introduce? Those are the places where I look to intervene. Those are the places where I think groups like, like you all have so much opportunity because a lot of it's capacity. A lot of people just don't know about research ethics or experimentation work and design. So a lot of it, you know, there's a lot of room to move the, the conversation forward positively, but it is, you know, any, 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 anything that a government, that a government or a company or a person says, look, this is it. This is a solution. We just did this. We solved this political complexity by giving you X, right. You know, is almost never, never the case. So uh, engaging with that political complexity and focusing on the governance design that comes out of data trust, I think might, might be a really interesting opportunity, but uh, you know, certainly, using them by themselves won't solve much. Thank you, Sean. Sure thing. Uh, I guess that's it. I, uh, I just want to check if anyone else has a question. I haven't seen anything on YouTube or Zoom. Maybe you can just end it here. Yeah, okay. no Is questions. It? All right, <laughs> thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Sean.